Good morning and welcome to a, a great conversation we're about to have on uh, several problems that uh, Navajo County faces and a, a couple of housekeeping things. One is uh, please be careful of the cameras there. We don't want to knock them over. And uh, two is that we have a, a couple of sponsors today, uh, Summit Healthcare and WellCare. If you could give them a round of applause, we appreciate their help. My name is Bob Higgins. I'm the presiding judge in Navajo County. And every day I see the problems we're about to talk, uh, discuss uh, with you. And I'm hoping that uh, this can be a useful conversation for our entire community to get together and try to come up with some solutions. Uh, we're fortunate to have uh, Dr. Jill Stam, who was a professor at ASU for 25 years and is now with Arizona Childhood Association for the last 13 years. And she's going to uh, discuss the uh, trauma that children often encounter and, and its causes. Uh, there may be some acronyms today that you don't, uh, that you're not familiar with. One is ACE, which is Adverse Childhood Experiences, and uh, the other is Adverse Community Environments. So if you hear our speakers talking about a pair of ACEs, th that's the pair. And then the uh, other acronym you might not know is Building Community Resilience, BCR. And, uh, our second speaker, Dominic Capello, is going to talk extensively about that. So the format today will be Dr. Stam will speak first, and then we're not going to have a break in between, and uh, Dominic Capello is going to speak about uh, data-driven prevention of ACE and trauma. In Navajo County, we have a lot of adverse childhood experiences, and, and they manifest themselves in, in adults, and that's when I see them in court. The sheriff here, Sheriff Klaus, uh, is with us today. He sees them in, in his everyday uh, patrols. And our, in our government, uh, we have all kinds of uh, manifestations of trauma uh, as adults, and we're dealing with that uh, on a daily basis. So I'm very interested to hear what Dr. Stam has to say and, and uh, Dominic Capello about not only the underlying problem, but how to address it. So the second part of the seminar this morning is going to be 10 steps, 10, 10 ways we can address this uh, problem of adverse childhood experiences and the trauma it causes, which uh, comes out in people as adults. So with no further ado, I'd like to ask Dr. Stam to uh, come up. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be back in your community and to see the kind of excitement and commitment uh, from local government officials and healthcare people and educators. Um, I, I do live in Phoenix, but I fantasize about retiring here. <laughs> and I've been driving around in some of the areas going, oh, I could maybe come there, maybe I could go there. So you may see me again uh, up here quite frequently. Uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, I'm a retired faculty member from ASU, but I have been working in the field of early brain development for a very long time. I started an organization about 20 some years ago called New Directions Institute, which then melded into Arizona's Children Association. Um, this wonderful quote by Maya Angelou, uh, forms, I think, the background for everything that I do and the, the, the groups of people that I work with. Most parents really do try to, to do the very best that they can with their children. But when you give them new information, good information, and something that feels like it's something they could do, they do it. I, I find it very inspiring to see change in parenting behaviors due to new learning. In my own life, um, I'll tell you a couple of little short stories about me and my family. Um, I'm the mom of two children, um, uh, Kristen, who 
grew up to become a neuroscientist, which was fabulous for me because I've been dabbling in neuroscience for many, many years, but to have my own little neuroscientist that I can call at any moment is fantastic, <laughs> right? Um, you don't want to be at our table at Thanksgiving, however. The two of us just, everybody's like, could you stop talking about brains for a minute? <laughs> um, but the, my other child, Jenny, my oldest child, was born in 1974, a long time ago, when they were very first putting tiny preemies onto respirators. And I was only 26 weeks pregnant, and she weighed a pound and a half when she was born. So that was my introduction into motherhood. And <clears throat> a long story short, after seven months in intensive care, a few weeks before she, I knew that I was gonna finally be able to take her home, the neonatologist said, um, by the way, we need to just level with you. She is never gonna talk. She is never gonna walk. And then they saw a bunch of other nevers. And if you're like I am, I didn't hear those other nevers. I'm like, never walk and never talk? So, but you know and I know, we never give up on a child, never. So bringing her home, I did the only thing I knew how to do, and that was to talk. So of the walking and talking, I knew, because I had been a classroom teacher, I was a fifth grade teacher when she was born. So I did what I knew. Turns out, all these years later, there's an abundance of research that says that mere talking to a child, lots and lots and lots of talking, is directly related. There's a direct linear relationship to their later testable IQ. Now, I'm going to repeat that because that's kind of a cool statement for you to know and for you to spread to your grandchildren and children and, and anybody that you know, the sheer number of words that a child hears in birth to three has a direct linear relationship to their later testable IQ. So that was lucky, lucky, lucky. So we're here today to talk about how to solve some of the problems that everyone in attendance knows exists in this county, in this state, and in this country. But there are lots of choices of things we could do. And I want to tell you, a lot of them work really well. And it's kind of like the choice that we have. If you feel like having a hamburger, you've got a lot of choices. You can go lots of different places. You can go some old places, some, some, some favorite things that you've known for 30 years or some newer places. When IHOP said they were gonna become IHOP, did you hear that little talk? I don't know, the International House of Burgers instead of the International House of Pancakes? I don't know, anyway. But all of, the, all of these burgers have the same ingredients and that's what a lot of the programs that you will hear talked about and discussed. People develop their favorite of different programs, but the basic understanding that all of them now have incorporated is this notion of brain development and what is the impact of toxic stress on brain development, on the circuits in the brain, on the ability of the brain to learn new information and ever be able to retrieve that information. And those are sort of two different problems, but within the brain there are circuits that we will talk about. So I'm gonna give you about this much of brain science before we <clears throat> uh, get too much further. But I wanna talk about stress. All of us are stressed. We have deadlines. We have uh, not enough money to cover what we know is coming in the future. Uh, lots of reasons to be stressed. But that is actually a positive. It is a motivator. When you feel a little stressed about something, you end up doing an action plan. You say, all right, this is what I need to do to avoid that. Um, I gave this example the other day in a conference. Um, a few months ago, I missed a, a, an, airplane, a, an airplane trip. Uh, I had not given myself enough time to get through the TSA. 
So that was a little bit of stress. I had to reschedule. I had to call all the people at the other end and say, I'm really sorry, you know, blah, 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 blah. But it was a motivator because what I said in my brain was, I'm never doing that again. So haven't you many, many times said to yourself, whatever it is, you say, I'm never doing that again. So it allows you to make plans and to do things better and to do things differently in the future. That's positive stress. Tolerable stress for children, uh, an example is a four-year-old uh, whose grandmother dies. Now she gets very stressed because she sees the adults around her crying and, and she doesn't really understand what's going on. She has no idea what death really is, but it must be something scary and fearful. But she gets through it because she has relationships with other caring adults who help her to mitigate whatever those feelings of panic and, and, and distress are in her body and in her brain. Toxic stress is if that four-year-old little girl lives solely with her grandmother, and that's her only caregiver. She has nobody else besides her grandmother. If now that grandmother dies, it creates in her that the kind of stress that this little group here, we were talking about young children in this county coming to preschools, coming uh, into our communities really stressed because they don't know who's going to be taking care of them. They don't know who's going to pick them up at the end of the day. They don't know whether they're going to eat. Those kinds of problems over time, repeated, 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 is what we're talking about with toxic stress. So I think that's important to make the distinction that between the stress that we felt coming here this morning and getting up early enough and on, on a cold, rainy morning to get here. That's not what we're talking about when we're talking about brain-changing doses, repeated doses of stress. So here's some of the programs. You may have a favorite. Um, some of you are familiar with some of these uh, kinds of programs, Nurturing Parenting, Triple P, down in here, Nurse Family Partnerships. All of these work, all of them. Nurturing Parenting, for example, it's been around for 40 years. Stephen Bavilek, uh, an amazing guy, uh, it was his doctoral dissertation that he then grew into this whole program that not only goes nationally but worldwide. Same thing for down in, uh, in Australia, Matt Sanders, uh, 40 years. It was also his doctoral dissertation. So be careful if you're gonna go into a doctoral program and you may be in it for the rest of your life. Um, these guys have been at it for a very long time. This is Dr. Bruce Perry. I'm gonna talk just about this much about him in a couple of slides later. And the reason why I, I wanted you to know about him is because our governor, Governor Ducey, and his wife, Angela, have brought Dr. Bruce Perry's programs into Arizona, and you're gonna to start to hear a lot about it. When you have the governor behind you, you've got a lot, of, a lot of push and a lot of power to make things happen. And we now have uh, the opportunity to have his neurosequential model, and I'm gonna explain that a little bit to you, neuro. The sequential part of it is actually pretty easy, and I'm gonna, explain to you how the brain develops in a specific sequence. Your brain, my brain, the brains of your children, your grandkids, all of our brains, though unique, developed in the identical sequence. So this man's programs, Dr. Perry's programs, talk about how we can take an understanding of a simple sequence and layer on it behaviors and things that have happened to children and try to figure out how to heal the brain, and it works. He got a lot of notoriety on the 60 Minutes. If you've made it to Oprah, you've made it. <laughs> you know, she has that power to uh, expand our universe uh, with all kinds of new ideas, and um, this neurosequential model is one of them. She has made a statement, I, I haven't tracked it, I don't have a way to track it, but she has said that all of her philanthropy, 
from this point forward, dealing with education is going to be devoted to the brain and what Dr. Perry is bringing into our country. So this tells us not only is it a nice thing to do to protect a child's brain and to provide them with the things that they need, but it is really a great investment. Uh, James Heckman um, uh, won a Nobel Prize for figuring this out. This, so starting with early childhood, I'm not sure that you can actually see it there, but starting with early childhood, Head Start, public education, juvenile justice, mental health, criminal justice, and substance abuse. But look where the brain, the best opportunity to get it right, to get the brain, to get the circuits going well for a lifetime occur when we had no idea. Before neuroimaging, before brain imaging, we suspected that little children learned a lot really quickly, but we had no idea the degree to which the brain forms in these earliest years and that those patterns sustain throughout a lifetime. So, we are figuring out what's actually going on in the human brain with a number of different technologies. This is the easiest, simplest one. It's just a simple EEG. This little cutie pie here, um, sitting long enough to get all those electrodes <laughs> onto the cap. I don't know, she's a better behaved child than I ever had, I don't know. Um, but I wanted to make sure that as excited as I am about early brain development, there's actually a second opportunity to get it right and that, believe it or not, is in the teenage years. The teen brain goes through massive reorganization and growth in particularly what they call the frontal lobes. The frontal lobes are right here behind your, your forehead, and that part of the brain is what we consider adult functioning. It doesn't fully finish. Somebody call out, when do you, when do you know that the brain is really finished developing? Age. 25. I love that because long before brain scans, guess who knew that the brain finished at 25? Car rental companies. <laughs> Car rental companies, I mean, years ago, you know, 30 years ago, they were like, you know, until you're 25, you're not renting my car. So, why is that? It's because these frontal lobes are responsible for judgment for prioritizing information, for making good decisions, for knowing how to plan and execute something, um, for impulse control. That's a big one. We know that children throughout the growing up years have a problem with impulse control. And they actually should because they don't have enough neural tissue yet in their brains to completely manage their desires and their wants. So they, you know, if somebody wants a water bottle that's sitting over here, it's real fancy, it's kind of pink and it's got a bunch of flowers on it and I'm four years old, I just take it because I don't have much impulse control. My brain is not ready yet to monitor my behavior. So we do it for them. The adults monitor the children's behaviors. So a very brief look at the brain. The handout that I gave you um, on the first page talks about the parts. When we first started looking at the brain and figuring out which e what each part did, that was kind of cool and interesting to know that in the back of the brain is where vision is, but up front in the brain, that's what I was just talking about, having more adult thinking capacities. But as interesting as it is, it's sort of just knowing the parts doesn't really help us to figure out what to do if a kid is in trouble. So, if you look, if you turn your page, go to the next page, the inside of the brain really tells a better picture and helps us to know what is going right, what's going wrong, how we might intervene to help a child, and that's because of the inside of the brain. I'm gonna show you the two structures that matter the most in the topics that we're talking about. So one is called the amygdala, and you have two of them, one in each hemisphere, and the second is the hippocampus, also uh, one in each hemisphere. 
The amygdala is really important. It helps to keep you alive. It alerts you to something that's dangerous. So in order to stay alive, your brain is constantly sort of monitoring the environment to say, what bad thing could happen to me? And we are over the eons of our own human development. We've become really good at making sure that we're safe. That is if you're an adult and you're in control of yourself. If you're a little kid, who has to keep you safe? The adults. And when the adults don't keep you safe, the amygdala gets overactivated, and so they're monitoring the environment all the time. They are hypervigilant, hyperactive, and that's actually very adaptive. When I was a fifth grade teacher, I used to wonder why kids would just fly off the handle. That I'd have, I was telling about back in the day, we, we would line kids up to go into the lunchroom or line them up to go to, to recess. And I could always predict, you know, there's gonna be a lot of fighting in that line because somebody bumps a kid, and I mean, all they were doing was turning around, but the kid standing here hauls off and smacks the guy. And you're like, what's going on? Well, that kid's response to immediately respond with aggression keeps him alive in his house. Because guess what? If he doesn't fight really, really hard in his neighborhood where there's drive-by shootings and there's knifings and there's, you know, you gotta be a good fighter, right? So what has been at times in a person's life adaptive in order to survive becomes very maladaptive as we try to sim uh, assimilate into a society. So fight, flight, or freeze and it's on all the time, even when you're asleep. That's why the smoke alarm in your, in your home will alert you instantly, and it's your amygdala that picks it up first. So the hippocampus is the part of the brain that both stores memory and then ever, ever is able to retrieve it again. And notice that they are almost literally connected inside your head. So it means that things that are emotionally important to you, you store to a greater extent, and things that aren't so important, you don't. So as again, as a fifth grade teacher, uh, I, would wonder, I would wonder a lot of things. That's why I went back to school. I got my PhD actually in learning, because I wanted to figure out how it was that a kid that I knew was smart and that I would work with, and I knew that he understood the concept or she understood the concept, but the day of the test, nothing. What I didn't know then and I know now for sure is that anxiety and fear block the hippocampus's ability to find the information that's actually in your memory. So these, these things about the brain that we are finally learning, explain a lot of problems that children have in school, and it really describes a lot of problems that we have with their behaviors. So this is the new way to look at the brain. Uh, it's called diffusion tensor imaging. And so, I, as I said, it's kind of cool to know what the parts do, but what's really cool is to see how they are integrated to finally be able to understand what a thought is. By the way, I don't know one scientist who could actually give you a really clear understanding of that question. So what is a thought? We don't know that yet. It's kind of cool. So the brain develops, I'm gonna go back here a second, from the back of the brain to the front. It also develops from the inside of the brain growing out and from the bottom up. So way in the back, way down low, and in the center, coming all the way up and over, all in service to trying to get the thinking, reasoning, rational part of our brain to work really well. The, the cool thing about this new technology is look at how many circuits are going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth in the brain. This, the, the, input from the back of the brain, what you see and what you hear and what you feel, all coming to 
thinking about it, and then going back again and reflecting, and then coming back and thinking again, and going back and forth. The reason why I'm showing you these is to know that it's in the very center part of the brain in that diagram that I showed you where the amygdala and the hippocampus are, in the very center. So the emotional processing part of the brain, dead center here. So almost any time that a child or you and I as adults start thinking about something, we gotta pass right through the emotional part of our brain. What do we feel about it? What are we, are we like this? We're not, do we get distracted easily because we're nervous? And does the thought then get somehow stopped? The center part of the brain and the lower parts of the brain are what is causing a lot of the troubles that we see in children as they age and all of us as we age. So you've seen this you know, kind of a display before. This is what we see. These are the behaviors that we see from adults in the, in the criminal justice system or in the juvenile justice system. We see it every day. What we don't see is what caused it. So the science now is trying to go deep into the brain, into the, into the amygdala area, into the very center and into the brain stem to find out, number one, why it's dysfunctioning and what we can do about it. So today we're here to talk about what we can do about it. But I wanted to make sure that you understood that it's not the behavior itself. It is what has happened to a child prior to that moment in time when they broke into a house and stole a bunch of stuff. What is that about? Why, why are they doing that? You're going to hear uh, Dominic in a few minutes talk about ACEs. I'm going to give you just the briefest overview of it. This is a very complex slide. Basically, to show that the growth of a human being is rooted in all kinds of things that really matter. Uh, does someone have a home? Are, are they living in their car? If you're living in your car and you're three years old, your life is a lot different than the kid who is snuggled tightly in their, you know, Spider-Man bed with all their little toys around them. That's a big difference, and it matters. So all of these things at the bottom are what Dominic is going to talk about. What is the impact of poverty, of not having enough to eat, not having good housing? And how does that manifest later on into mental illness, physical and emotional neglect, divorce, and uh, substance abuse? Here's, and again, Dominic's going to take this deeper for you, but basically there's sort of two different kinds of dysfunction that things that happen to us every day in our lives. And the, the ACEs study that was done in the mid-90s where Kaiser Permanente, uh, a health insurance uh, organization in California, and then the Center for Disease Control got together to start to look at data. Uh, data is really important. Um, to collect information that then we can examine and decide if, if you know, what might be causing what. And so there, was a, there is a 10 question questionnaire that I think is on your table. Dominic, is it on the table? Okay. So you can look at that later. It's kind of interesting to take this test yourself. It's a questionnaire, it's not a test, it's a questionnaire. Um, and if you have a score of zero for once in your life, that's a good score to have. Zero is great. <laughs> 10 is not so great. And the distribution in between, and Dominic will be telling you he's not a zero, I'm not a zero. A lot of us in this room are not zeros. Um, so what does that mean? It means that you may have had recurrent physical abuse. Spanking, if spanking and beatings were in your home, maybe historically, uh, 
your parents, that's how they were disciplined and that's how their parents were disciplined, physical abuse has an impact on the brain. So does recur recurrent emotional abuse, downing a kid, telling them all the time that they're worthless, that they're, you know, nothing. Sexual abuse, emotional neglect and physical neglect. When you're really poor, a lot of times there's a lot of neglect. There simply isn't enough uh, food to go around. There aren't enough supervising adults, loving adults to go around leading to neglect. On the other side here, household dysfunction. Was anyone in your home when you were growing up an alcoholic or a drug user? Was anyone incarcerated? Was someone chronically depressed, suicidal, or mentally ill? Was the mother being treated violently and or, by the way, the father? And was there a single parent household or maybe no parents? So these are the kinds of things that contribute to changes in the brain that then some of the behavior, the, the, the top part of the, the, the iceberg that we see are really, we're beginning to understand, are coping mechanisms to deal with the pain and the hurt of things that have happened to us in our lives. Adolescence, boy, we begin to see this really strongly. You actually see it in preschool, you see it in elementary schools, and definitely in high school where all kinds of physical behaviors that you see kids do are really coping mechanisms. And when you really boil it down and you really begin to uh, address the underlying issues, some of these things are more curable. So this is a complex slide, so let's take this a little bit at a time. This about a third of the population in this country reports no ACEs. Those are lucky, lucky people. 51% um, report one to three ACEs and 16% have four or more. And what they have found is that the, that the likelihood of these various behaviors increases with the dose. It's called a dose response. Uh, and so over here with zero ACEs, let's just look at, um, let's look at alcoholism. If you have a zero, your chances of becoming, the likelihood of becoming an alcoholic, one in 69. But if you go all the way over to four or more ACEs, it's one in six. That is a huge difference. Come down here to, IV drug use, one in 480. If you have one to three, it drastically changes already down to one to 43, and over here, one to 30. Heart disease. Here's the thing, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. Before I learned about ACEs, I mean, I knew that Jenny's brain that had been very damaged, that I really needed to do a lot to protect it. I had no idea that things that happen to young children could in any way be related to cancer. How is that possible? What is that link? What the link is, is that the brain changes that occur also occur in the immune system. To lessen the immune system, so we have an increase in diabetes, we have an increase in heart disease, cancer, all kinds of things. Suddenly, this gets the attention of us as adults, it's like, wow, if my ACEs score is X or Y, maybe I need to stop eating the potato chips I'm eating. You know, <laughs> really, I, I need to take better care of myself. I need to, each, each of us as individuals, when you take and get your ACEs score, by the way, the 10 things that are on that ACEs test uh, aren't the only things that impact our, our lives. Uh, that, those were just the 10 things that have been studied over and over and over again. The initial, um, the initial test was done with uh, 17,000 adults, 70% of whom were white, 70% of whom were college educated. So th the, the original ACEs study was done on a very sort of high functioning group, as we would 
determine them in, this, in our society. So Dominic's gonna talk about this more. How am I doing time-wise? So coming back again with this slide about the, the return on investment. An investment in early childhood, $1 invested, yields anywhere between all of the estimates between $7 and $16. So when we as a society don't have very many dollars to go around, it's a really good investment to invest in early childhood, to invest in the training of early childhood staff members, uh, to invest in the training and education of parents. Anyone dealing with young children, you can see that this return on investment can be tremendous. So, there's a lot of words up here. The switch, they're talking about switching the lens. You know, it doesn't require each of us to change dramatically to be able to start to become trauma-informed. And, and, and in my own personal life, it, it does work. Instead of always thinking what is wrong with a person, now first really wondering, I wonder what's happened to that person. I wonder what kind of a life they've had. I wonder what kind of a morning they've had. You know, road rage, you know, doesn't necessarily mean that you were abused as a child. You could have a really bad moment and, you know, lash out at somebody. So what has happened to this person? This is my biggest message. Risk is not destiny. We get all tied up, I think, in all of this research and what does it say and isn't it terrible and what are we gonna do about it? And, but each person in this room, every single one of us knows somebody or a lot of somebodies who had a rough childhood and turned out pretty good. Risk is not destiny. When they told me Jenny would never talk, you have no idea how verbal this kid is. <laughs> she, if, if she were here, she'd be you know, nabbing you and saying, do you have any kids? You know, well, where are they? You know, how old are they? Do you have any dogs? <laughs> Very sophisticated use of language. And sometimes when she's really, now she rages a lot. I want to be able to tell you that. Her triggers, man, she goes from zero to 100 in a second. And when she does that, and I'm trying to control her behaviors, and I'll, sometimes I'm driving, you know, and I'll pull over to the side of the road because I don't want to discipline this kid in the state that I'm in. I need to get calm myself. But on the way, I'm like, Jenny Stamp, what is your problem? Now, she doesn't use any parts of her body. She's, she can't stand. She has no use of her legs. She has no use of her right hand. She has left hand use only. But with that left hand and the, her mouth, she. <laughs> this is Jenny. I don't know, mommy. I think I'm having an anxiety attack. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I didn't know she knew that word. She was about 12 when she pulled that little number. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Risk is not destiny. And it's because of neuroplasticity. Thank goodness, you and I can continue to learn and learn and learn and learn throughout our entire lifespan. We can uh, change, our brains can change, our children's brains can change. They can get better. Things can improve. I tell the story about it's never too late. Um, I told this story the other day. My mom is 102. She is in perfect health. She takes no medicine, unlike me. She takes no medicine. Um, and she learned how to use the computer when she was about 80. And she now has a blog. How crazy is that? I don't have a blog, but my 102-year-old mother has one. She came out here for Mother's Day. And um, the last time she came out, I was a little concerned because my brother, who lives near her in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, usually takes her to the airport. She flies all over the place. But um, he was out of town, and I said, Mom, you know, maybe, maybe you shouldn't come. You know, Rob isn't available for you. And she said, are you kidding? I'll just take an Uber. 
Okay. Yeah. How are we doing time wise? What? Oh, good. All right. So I wanted to show you. I've tried to simplify the brain for you, uh, but it is extremely complex. A little, uh, you know, drawing like this begins to, to uh, elaborate that. But this very complex model um, can be simplified, and this is Dr. Perry's work, where he really looks at the brain's development in this sequence from the back to the front, the inside out, and the bottom up. And onto that, he maps, um, I'm gonna go ahead here a second. I'll show you the map first and then we'll come back. This is called brain mapping. What, and this does not require expensive um, brain scans for a child. Um, this is an example of one, an age typical kid, age 11 to 13, see all the green areas? That means that that child's brain from brain stem going up and out is developing per perfectly normally for all of the ages and stages. It still has more to go up here in the frontal lobes, but here's a child about the same age, and the red areas mean severe dysfunction. So without a scan, so you say, well, how do you develop this map if you aren't gonna scan their brains? You take a really good, thorough history of what has happened to the child and at what age. So for my Jenny, the age was prenatal. And so I know that down low, wh where, where this one has the sevens, you see the, the three yellow sevens and the one green 11, my Jenny's would be red all the way up the whole brainstem because she had two surgeries when she was in the NICU with no anesthetic. That was the state of the art at the time. And when I heard that they were going to do these surgeries, I'm like, with no anesthetic, I mean, I had the same reaction that you just had, like, what? And the doctors assured me, oh, well, she won't ever remember it. Well, Cognitively, up in here, she doesn't remember it, but her brain stem knows that bad things can happen to you in a second that you had no idea was coming. And that's why she's so hypervigilant. That's why it's so hard to calm her down. The kids that you work with, you know that kids, when you see a kid and that you know that they just went from zero to 100, that is a part of their brain that is in panic mode. That is a part of their brain that is completely out of control. They are in fear. It goes from alarm being a little like, uh-oh, what's going on, to fear of something bad, really something bad's gonna happen. I'm gonna run, I'm gonna do this, up until terror. Terror, when a person's brain, at any age, a kid or you and I, when we are terrorized, we have almost no access to our frontal lobes. We can't make decisions. We don't know what's happening. We lose all sense of time. By the way, when you are in terror, there is no such thing as knowing what time it is or how much time has elapsed. That's in a different part of your brain. So I'm gonna go back here just a second. So here's Dr. Perry's model. Again, brain stem going up he calls it the diencephalon. It's just really where the brain stem starts to come into, into your skull, into the brain area. And then this neocortex is all of the stuff that we typically think of as a brain, the folded parts of, of around the brain. You can see it goes all the way from body temperature, heart rate, blood pressure, ability to sleep, all the way up through arousal, sexual activity, um, attachment, affiliation, and at the very top, abstract and concrete thought. So if you and I, and for the majority of my life, I thought I could talk people in or out of something. <laughs> 
Well, you can if they are also up there in their neocortex and able to think and feel and respond and reflect and do all of those kinds of things, great. But if they're down lower in the brain, talking does absolutely nothing because they actually don't hear you. So when you think about kids who are involved in criminal activity or severe aggression, and we're just going to sit down and give them a little lecture, it doesn't do anything. I'll share another small little Jenny story. I want to be a patriotic American, so when she was really little, I wanted to take her to show her the 4th of July fireworks. What a great thing that was going to be. And on the way there, I'm describing to her, because by now I knew that verbally she was listening and that she was comprehending. Um, and I was describing to her the beautiful colors that we were going to see in the sky and how amazing it was going to be until the first kaboom. Wow. <laughs> I really lost her. And, and now I'm trying to tell her, oh, honey, that... That's nowhere near here. It's, it's over there. You know, these guys, they know what they're doing. They're just, she's screaming at the top of her lungs. And then the second one goes off, and the third one goes off. Well, I had to just scoop her up and, and get her out of there. Year two. It takes a while for me to learn. <laughs> I'm coming back at it. You know, we're going to go. We're going we're, we're gonna to be good people. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to be good people, and we're going to go and celebrate our country. And same thing happened. By year three, the mere mention of going to fireworks would set her off, and she's screaming at the top of her lungs. So by year four, the rest of the family goes to fireworks, and Jenny and I go shopping. You know, it's just, you just have to make those accommodations for What's really going on with somebody? It wasn't worth putting her through any part of that anxiety and distress. So this is Dr. Perry's model, and that's what uh, he's working with now. So he maps the likelihood that the disruptions in brain development are impacting the behavior of a child in very expected ways. So again, take a thorough history, find out what age the child was, did the disruption happen when the child was two and the grandma died and there was nobody to take care of the child and so she went into foster care and then she went to a second foster home and then to a third and a ninth foster home? You track what has happened to a child and then go back in time and try to supplement the experiences that the child is having that they missed. So that sounds kind of odd until you actually do it with a child. My best friend adopted a five-year-old from Russia who was very, he'd been in an orphanage. I mean, all of the things that you may have heard on the news about how disrupting that can be to a child's development. And so the family just thought they would treat him like a normal five-year-old, and so they enrolled him in school, and they enrolled him in t-ball, and he got kicked out of absolutely everything for aggressive behavior and an inability to adapt. So finally, the family came to me and to my daughter, the little neuroscientist, and said, do you have any suggestions? And we said, you need to parent him at the age at which he is behaving. And they said, well, he's acting like a two-year-old. I said, uh-huh. What I want you to do is hold him a lot. I want you to sing to him. I want you to read to him. I want you to get in bed with him and hold him tight and read stories. And I want you to do it every day. Not some day. I want you to do it every day, multiple times a day. The brain learns through repetition, 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 repetition. So as a 12-year-old, now this kid didn't want any of his buddies to know that, but his dad still every day lays in bed with this kid and now instead of reading storybooks they read hot rod magazines together but it still go it still goes on this kid now is 21 years old he works for lexus he's an 
a computer engineer person. He earns way more money than I do. <laughs> and so treating the child, giving them what they missed is at the very core of what is going to be happening here in Arizona. So I, I need to show you this. Uh, this is the neurosequential model, the neurosequential model um, of therapy, this neurosequential model of caregiving. So there's lots of people around the state being trained in this model. Um, they're starting in January. January 28th, this neurosequential model of education started. There will be thousands of school teachers and preschool teachers who are going to be trained in this model to help to understand that you interact with the child at the age at which they are behaving and start the therapy and the repair at that time. Does that make sense? It's hard to, it's hard to grasp, but, but there are lots of things uh, that are being done. Governor Ducey's wife, Angela, described her family situation. It's actually her sister who adopted a nine-year-old, uh, or no, a again, a five or six-year-old, and his ACEs score, and she told us, so I feel free to pass it on, that no one told her when she adopted this child that the kid's ACEs score was a nine. They discovered it pretty quick. It disrupted the entire Ducey family cousins and aunts and uncles and everybody, and Angela Ducey and her sister started going around this country because a lot of things are going on in the country. And I, that's why I'm so proud of all of you um, here. I think to, to hit this on directly takes courage. It really takes a lot of, of communication between and among all of you. Um, it's good stuff. It's good stuff to, to hit it now and to start to do something. So what's going on nationally and, and even internationally and locally? Um, Mayor Mitchell in Tempe, about two years ago actually, decided that Tempe was going to become the most trauma-informed city in America. And with a, with a bold statement like that, um, he actually has hired a couple of people who go around. I see the firefighters back here. Um, Every first responder has been trained thoroughly in ACEs and in trauma-informed responses. How, how could you behave the same or differently depending upon what the situation is? So all firefighters, all the police department, all of the city employees, um, all high school teachers. It was actually the high school teachers who asked to get this training because guess what, the suicide rate in Tempe high schools is the highest it has ever been. And the teachers are going crazy. They're like, what is going on? This is not okay. So that's sort of local here. Um, Wisconsin has decided that they're going to become the most trauma-informed state in the United States. And on my feed, I get lots of stuff on ACEs every single day in my email. And I love this one because I'm Scottish. And um, so Scotland has decided that they're going to be the most trauma-informed country in the world. So there's a good competition. It's a healthy competition. And you guys are ahead of this, the, the game here. I don't know of any other county who has decided they're going to be trauma-informed and actually do something. So the do something is coming up here in about five minutes. Um, I wanted to show you, this is a real client at Arizona's Ch uh, Children Association. This is the, the child at 13 years, nine months, and you can see a lot of red and pink. And this is that same child uh, at 14 years and four months. Actual brain changes, the circuits in the brain are now going in different directions, and they are not automatically triggering to the same things that, that the brain used to trigger to. I'll repeat it again. It's never too late. This was a 13-year-old. Can you imagine the kinds of progress that we can make if we start with five-year-olds or four-year-olds or parent education so that this never happens? I'm going to conclude with this. 
the, the advice of Dr. Perry is to never start with trying to reason with someone, but to start to, first of all, regulate yourself. It's not easy if there's a kid who's in front of you who's kicking you and biting you and telling you to stay calm. <laughs> That's hard. To recognize that this work is really, really hard, but to know intellectually that it's possible if I calm myself down, I can begin to calm my child down, and then through relationships can finally get to the point where we're reasoning. And it may be that for a specific child, it takes a really long time before you start reasoning with them. You're bouncing back and forth between regulating and relating, and regulating and relating, regulating and relating. So I want to leave you with this thought. <laughs> Very hard to do, but something that is a goal for all of us and our teachers and our firefighters and our police and our city workers, all of us, to keep ourselves calm and regulate and then go about the difficult task of trying to regulate our children. Thank you. Thank you. What we can do after Dominic's talk is, is put some of this into action. We have people here from, from the government. Uh, we have our board of super, two of our board of supervisors are here, the county manager, the assistant county manager. We have educators here, principals from different schools. We have leaders from the religious uh, communities, uh, different churches. And uh, we have first responders and policemen here. We even have bikers against child abuse here, so thank you for coming today. All right, uh, our next speaker, Dominic Capello, uh, went to Long Beach State, and he has written a bestseller book called Anna, Age Eight, and he's an expert on uh, childhood trauma and uh, how it manifests itself in adulthood. Uh, he's, he's made it, he's been on Oprah, and he also, uh, perhaps most impressively, was Captain Hook in the, in the Disney production at Disneyland, the original one, uh, and when he was in school to help him get through school. So the original Peter Pan. Uh, so uh, Dominic, with no, with no further ado, uh, thank you for speaking today. All right, I don't think I've ever been introduced as both Captain Hook and Peter Pan before this topic, but um, maybe it's good we have a, have a light moment. Um, what I'm about to talk about is going to be a very um, tough conversation for you. And before I start this conversation, which is a story about Anna, age eight, and making sure that her story is not repeated in Arizona, I'd like you to all stand up. So what we're about to talk about is going to require a lot of um, courage and compassion. And so what I'd like you to do is just take one deep breath in and out. And if you need to during my talk, stand up, go to the back of the room, um, do whatever you need to do, but I'll be talking for a bit but then we're going to be um, very interactive, and you're going to be up and doing things, because Anna's story requires action. So please have a seat. So Anna, age eight. Institute at Northern New Mexico College. What I'm about to share with you is, is kind of an amazing and inspiring story. And a, it's a really a story of hope that followed a very tragic story. And um, the book, Anna, Age 8, The Data-Driven Prevention 
of childhood trauma and maltreatment um, was started uh, with my colleague, Dr. Catherine Ortega Courtney. We were working in a basement. We were working two doors, two floors down in Santa Fe, New Mexico, in the child welfare office. And uh, when you work in child welfare, we were working in the research assessment and data bureau. So we were not in the field. We were collecting the data. And I think most of you know that in child welfare world, you do not move a child from a home to a car, to an office, to a foster parent. There are no moves without reports. Everything is logged. They, child welfare probably has more data than any group in the United States because every movement of a child, every meeting with a child and their parent is recorded. So we knew in New Mexico, from all 33 counties, the county offices pouring in reports, who's being investigated, who's being substantiated, um, who's in foster care, who's up for adoption, will parents be able to reunify or will we terminate parental rights? So that was our life, that was our job. And when you work in child welfare, you dread the day, but you know it's coming, of the high profile report that comes out in the news. It could be a horrendous case of abuse or neglect, but Sometimes you hear about the child fatality. You hear about the child who didn't make it. And of course, when that happens, the news comes in and they want to point blame very quickly. Um, and so this was just another day in the basement. Catherine and I are working and then the news came in that a little child had been killed and um, it was another very sad afternoon, but this case was a little different than most. And um, we were so mortified by this case that we then and there committed to write a book about how this could have happened. And we call the child Anna. It's not the child's real name. We changed the name to protect the family. Um, but it's based, Anna's based on a very, very real child. Um, and that child could easily live in this community. It just so happened it was in my community. But the story um, um, caught the attention, um, well, the, the story caught the attention of not only the news cycle, but of course the state lawmakers and the governor. Mortified. How could this happen? And um, that led to us committing to the book that took a few years to write and also um, getting the book out and released a year ago and um, making the decision that it would be made available to free, free to anybody who wanted it. Um, and eventually it caught the attention of a state senator. And I'll tell you more about that story, but um, there was in New Mexico real interest in the book, real interest in Anna's story, real interest in making sure that never happened again. And it led to a Senate bill with bipartisan support um, funding the Anna Age 8 Institute, which will be at Northern New Mexico College. So there's a longer story there, but I'm telling you kind of the story all up front to know that there was an incredible tragedy that led to people just like you deciding enough is enough. Getting the word out there to people just like you in a room, just like this, getting the attention of some pretty powerful lawmakers who said, we need more than a book, we need a strategic plan. We need more than workshops, we need more than conferences. Now, don't get me wrong, we need all of you educated. And Dr. Stam has done an incredible job. You need that information, but if we stop there, we don't get anywhere. It's time to take big action. So what I'm gonna to propose to you is unlike anything you've probably ever heard because we have to do things very, very differently or there will be more Annas. But the good news is in our state that we've made a huge commitment with the funding of this institute and 
I've come here because I've been invited by Ari Ari people from Arizona who said, well, if New Mexico is going to try this, you, we should at least present the model to people in Arizona to see, do you want to take this model on? So let me tell you a little bit more about Anna. So Anna, it was reported that Anna um, was in trouble in her home, and so an investigator went out, as they do, evaluated the house, and determined that she was not safe. So they took Anna out of the house. So now Anna's in custody. And then they determined that it was okay to put her back with her mother. Her mother had a very long history of mental health challenges, violence, and substance misuse. But they determined she would be safe. So Anna went back. And then another report. So Anna was pulled. And then they determined Anna would be safe. We're up to two, right? Three times, four times, five times, the sixth time, pulled. She's not safe. We've determined she's safe now. Seven times, eight times. And of course, this won't surprise you, when she finally went back, her mother kicked her to death. Who could be surprised? Eight times? Wouldn't you think by the third report there's something pretty wrong in that house? And that mom's in serious trouble. And Anna is in real trouble. So Catherine and I thought long and hard about this and thought there's just so much wrong on so many levels. And so we decided our book will be an expose of child welfare. We're really going to expose what happened here. Now, we love our coworkers in child welfare, and it wasn't our intention to point fingers at them. They're some of the hardest working, most caring people on the planet. But the system is totally broken. It doesn't work. And I spent a lot of time working with other child welfare systems, um, working to improve their system. But I can tell you, from New Mexico to New York City to Connecticut to Pennsylvania, it's the same thing noble-hearted people working in a system that does not keep our children safe. And people often think, why doesn't child, wel child welfare work differently? I mean, it's their job to protect them. They should be preventing things. Child welfare is not paid, and has never been paid, really, to prevent. Now, they will have some programs called prevention, but they are not set up to go into the community, to go into your community, and to make sure all the services that must work are working. It's not their job. But let me tell you, when there's a child death, the fingers, they're pointed at child welfare. So Anna's story um, is horrific, but stories like Anna are happening every day, not as dramatic. But does it really matter that it was eight times, three times, two times? So when the book came out, um, and this book, I should say, was not the one that got on Oprah. That's an earlier book. Uh, but thanks for that plug anyway, Judge. Um, and I can tell you some Oprah stories if you want to hear them uh, later. But uh, uh, this book didn't get that kind of attention. I should tell you that when we were writing the book, I contacted my editor, who did publish three of my books wonderful woman who really likes me, thought the book was incredible, super important. And she said, you know, I've looked at your proposal and I've read your first chapter and, you know, it's so important. Everyone should read this book. However, you know, Dom, you and Catherine, you really, you've got these great stories about Anna and they're horrific. Could you get more of those stories of other horrific stories? Like, why don't you do the book just about really horrific stories? Because America will buy that book. But your book is about solutions and talking about policy and programs. And, and I, you know, that's, that's like a government book. No one's going to buy that. So, Dom, if you change it, I think we can publish it, get you back to Oprah. Wouldn't that be great? And Catherine, I, that's not why we're writing the book. In this society... Our mobile devices and our TVs give us horrific stories 24-7. I don't think you need 
more horrific stories about children at risk, do you? It's too much. It's just too much. We've become numb to the torture, abuse, and neglect of our children. We all feel it's terrible. We all do. The moment I said it, you thought, that's terrible. But then we want to know, can we just get to the next Starbucks, you know, and, and, and hang out? I mean, our brains, in a way, can't take it on. And my theory, and many other people have a theory, and Dr. Nadine Burke, who was referenced, shares the theory. Why don't we adults, why aren't we doing, why aren't we engaged in this conversation much more in doing things? It's painful to think about this. And we don't want, our brain does not want pain or sadness. We want that warm latte. We really do. We want that comfort. And we have to stop that. And we're going to stop it, as a matter of fact. Um, sorry, I meant to say that when the book came out, I got a call um, about just a week after the book came out. It, it, got a lot, it did get a lot of attention in New Mexico, and so I got a call at a, a, 9 o'clock on a Saturday night, actually, um, from Cassandra Gondara, who was a city council person in Las Cruces. And I, I, had, I had known Cassandra years earlier because she had worked in child welfare before she retired and ran, and ran for office and won. And she's calling me and she's saying, Dom, I just finished Anna, age eight. I go, that's great. How was it? It's fantastic. It says at the end to call you, get a hold of you, to start doing the work. So I'm calling you right now. I go, okay, Cassandra, that's great. Nine o'clock on a Saturday night. That's cool. Um, I go, do you have funding to, to start a significant project? She goes, I just finished the book. There's no funding. I mean, I'm just ready to go. I go, well, can we get funding? She goes, I don't know. I don't think that should matter. We should just start doing what you said to do. And I thought for a minute, and I thought, she's absolutely right. Why should we wait for money? Yes, we're going to need money. Yes, we're going to need staff. Yes, we're going to have to do the things you do when a community decides to commit to take care of their children. But should we, should we be waiting for permission to start that process? No. So I said, let's go. So she started. So she did, uh, she put out the call, and she said, well, who do I invite? I said, well, if you've read the book, you know that we talk about 10 sectors that have to work. You know the sectors, behavioral health care, medical care, housing, food, shelter, the basics, moving on to quality schools, early childhood learning, youth mentors, um, jobs, job training, um, parent supports. I go, why don't you just invite all the leaders of the agencies who, who, who do that work in your county? So she did, um, and uh, we thought, she thought, Dom, maybe we'll get 20 people. You know, that's a good start in Las Cruces. And so I came down, and we had about 45 people had shown up. And so that started the work. And I'm going to tell you more about what the work is. As a matter of fact, you're going to start doing the work in just a bit. But uh, uh, my point is this. She just read that book, and she said, I could not not call you. I mean, I know I should have waited till Monday, but I just felt like I had to start this because enough is enough. So that started, and as I mentioned, um, well, there were some incredible people. So the next call that came in, um, what well, was an email from Dr. Richard Bailey, who is the president of Northern New Mexico College, which is about 30 minutes north of Santa Fe. And it, it, it's in the county of Rio Arriba, and Rio Arriba has been known for a long time as having um, the highest um, drug overdose death rates in the nation. They're either number one, number two, or number three. It, I mean, think about it. An epidemic of substance mis misuse. Um, people literally die in, 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 in parking lots um, overdosing. It, it, it's a very, very sad um, environment to grow up in. Um, but this college is a beacon of hope. And uh, so we met with Dr. Bailey, and Catherine and I, we always feel like we have to go into a meeting and sell people. Like, I sort of feel like I have to sell you on making sure our kids are safe. And uh, it's just the nature of the beast of our work. But we got in there, we didn't have to sell him. He was ahead of us. He held up the book. This is a campus issue. 
Three out of four of my students do not make it through our programs. I am convinced it has to do with trauma. And I know we have to be doing work on this campus. And I know we need to be a beacon of hope for the city and the county. We've got to start the work. Tell me how we do it. Just, Catherine and I left that meeting like, what just happened in that meeting? I mean, how often does a college president do that? So it was pretty powerful. And he says, let's start thinking about how we're going to set this up on a county level. And we're going to be in charge of it. We're going to work with you. We're going to turn your book into reality. And then um, Senator Souls um, from our state um, called me one night. I get these night. Well, people work during the day. They call you at night. He says, I've got to meet you for dinner. I really need to meet. I want to talk about your book and something that happened. And so I said, of course. So he says, I gave the ACES survey, the 10 question survey, to my students in my advanced placement psychology class in high school in Las Cruces. And um, I tabulated they, anonymously, and I got, got it back. And this was part of just us talking about it as a psychology class, why they need to know about it. But they were, they, they were comfortable doing it, and so we got the results. And uh, you're now holding what we gave them. If you look in your packet, do you all have the ACEs survey? It says, what percent are safe from trauma? So this is what Senator Souls asked his high school students. And uh, one, did a parent or other adult in the household often or very often push, grab, slap, or throw something at you or ever hit you so hard you had marks or were injured? Imagine answering yes to that. You know, we want our kids to do their math homework. And that's what's happening to this kid, little Jenny, little Joe. Two, did a parent or other adult in the household often or very often swear at you, insult you, put you down, or humiliate you, or act in a way that made you afraid that you might be physically hurt? Imagine your high school student and you've answered yes to those first two questions. Their math homework, right? Why wasn't your homework done? Why are you slacking off in school? Why don't you concentrate more? And little Jennifer's answered yes to those two. Three, did an adult or person at least five years older than you ever touch or fondle you or have you touch their body in a sexual way or attempt or actually have oral, anal, or vaginal intercourse with you? I mean, really? Little Susan answers yes to that, and we're upset because she's acting out in the classroom. Imagine you've answered yes to these three. Four, did you often or very often feel that no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special or that your family didn't look out for each other, feel close to each other, or support each other? So now little Philip has answered four. And we wonder why he starts fights at school. It's probably going to drop out. Do we really have to wonder why these kids are acting this way? And I, I know that these questions are hard because it's about our lives too. Five, did you often or very often feel that you didn't have enough to eat, had to wear dirty clothes, or had no one to protect you? Or your parents were too drunk or high to take care of you or take you to the doctor when you needed to go? These are forms of neglect that are happening everywhere in this community, in my community, across the nation. Six, did you live with anyone who was a problem drinker or alcoholic? or who use street drugs? Seven, was your parent or step-parent often or very often pushed, grabbed, slapped, or hit by a thrown object? Or sometimes often or very often kicked, bitten, hit with a fist, or hit with something hard, or ever repeatedly hit for at least a few minutes, or threatened with a gun or knife? Imagine kids answering yes to these seven questions. Eight, was a household member depressed or mentally ill, or did a household member attempt suicide? Yes or no. Nine, were your parents separated or divorced? Ten, did a household member go to prison? So this is what Senator Souls, Dr. Souls, asked his high school students. Three quarters of the students had three or more ACEs. 
many with five, six, seven, eights, nines, and tens. He thought this class must somehow, it can't represent, it can't represent the high school. So he decided to do it to another classroom. Got the identical response. So if we want to know, we adults in this room want to know what's happening to our children outside those doors. If we want to know, we can know, we can, we can ask them, is this happening to you? And I can have a long conversation about how to do the survey, the appropriate way to do it. Um, there are lots of things to think about, but we adults in the room need to know because living in denial won't change anything. And you can imagine little Anna's score. She never took the ACEs survey. She didn't live long enough to be in a situation where she was given that survey. So this is why this is hard work for us, because this is our life we're talking about. It's my life. You know, when I scored five on this, I was shocked. Because I knew my, I knew my childhood was tough. That's what we call it. Guys would call it. I had a tough childhood. But I didn't look at it that way. So I called my twin sister on the East Coast, and I said, could you do the survey? And I would just want to know what's going on here. Same. Same kind of response in that we grew up in a household with abuse and neglect. But had you asked me before I learned about ACEs, if I grew up in a household with abuse and neglect, I would have just said, it was just a tough, it was tough, really tough. So now we know, now we know what's going on out there. And uh, trust me, I'm about to turn the corner with this talk because we spent a lot of time for 20 years since the advent of the original ACEs study so we're going to turn a corner here. I, I, I did want to stress the point that for 20 years we have known since the adverse childhood study was done with 17,000 people. We knew then when that report was published that we were in trouble. So this is not new news. How many of you raise your hand? Is this the first time you're hearing about the term ACEs? Can you raise your hand if this is the first time you're hearing about it? All right, okay, all right, interesting. So 20 years ago, we as a nation were warned. And I can tell you the reaction to that publication. And by the way, they had recommendations. We really need to get in there and really need to get supports for our parents. We really need, especially home visitation, that has to be universal. Let's just make sure this doesn't happen. Those were all ignored. It just met with deafening silence. Um, but now, 20 years later, that is not the way we're going to move forward. Certainly not in New Mexico. Um, so Senator Souls met up with uh, Republican rep Representative Gail Armstrong from Socorro County, who said, I am absolutely behind the idea of an institute that will be a technical assistance center that will support every county in following the recommendations of that book. So we had bipartisan support, which was very important because this isn't a partisan issue. It doesn't matter what side of the aisle you sit on. Kids in crisis matter to everybody. And there are huge costs associated with this. So an epidemic of childhood trauma is not free. Arizona pays for an epidemic every single day. Your child welfare system and their overtime, your judges, your police departments. And of course, because ACEs can lead to substance misuse and mental health challenges, suddenly now all the systems get overburdened and additional problems start popping up. So now the workforce is in trouble. We can't, we can't get, we, if, if, if you have an epidemic of trauma and, and adults have untreated trauma, these workers, they're gonna be calling in sick a lot absenteeism, and if they do show up, they're not ready to work. Um, lots of problems for the workforce. So if communities want to be a business-friendly community, they better think about an epidemic of childhood trauma, because it becomes an epidemic of family trauma, and then it's an epidemic impacting the workforce. And I should say that I was 
pleasantly surprised to be invited. I've talked to two Chamber of Commerces. I, in my field of work, public health and child welfare, I'm not invited to, to a Chamber of Commerce. So I, I gave one speech to um, 500 business people and another to 100, and they both said the same thing. They, the audience was interesting in that they didn't move at all during the talk. And I mean, like, not, they weren't on their cell phones, which nowadays is considered unbelievable. Um, they just sat there, and I thought, have I even, am I reaching these people? But at the end of it, people coming up, I never knew this was going on. No one ever asked me to get involved, and what do you want me to do? So this is a problem for the public sector, and it's a problem for the private sector, which is why we've got to come together here. So people say, well, you want to have community supports. Like, that's good. Like, how, how do we know if we're there? Like, well, you're there when you've reached 100% of your children and your parents. If 100% of your children and parents can say to you, we can access mental health care when there's a crisis, then you've arrived. So the first step in my project that you're all about to start in this room is uh, you assess. So we assessed um, the county, and we have a survey. In the back, it's in the back of the book of Anna, age eight, and it's extended now. We just asked parents and youth, to what degree do you have access to these 10 services? And they tell you, and in some counties, in Socorro County, they did the survey, and uh, I'm watching the results. They've made pie charts, and every one is almost identical. 75% of the parents and youth say they cannot access or easily access these services. And I'm talking things like safe shelter and food. I mean, I think in the United States of America, really hunger? is existing here, I mean, it, 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 that to me is incomprehensible with this much wealth. But my point is, I saw all 10 slides from Socorro County, all of them, about 75% don't have access. And one was like almost total access. And that was like early childhood learning programs. And I said to them, what, what is it about early childhood learning programs that they do so well and the other ones are not? And the organizers of the event said, well, we as a community decided a while ago that everyone should have access to early childhood learning programs, so we all work together to do that. I go, well, that's incredible. Could you just do the same thing in nine other sectors? Um, so it was really interesting. Um, so again, I want to stress that there are 10 key services in this community or the communities you come from. If these services are robust and exist, all the bad stuff goes down, all the good stuff goes up. And my good stuff, families that function, schools where kids achieve, higher employment, a functioning society where everyone gets a chance to succeed. So think about the 10 services. There are five to survive and five to thrive. And we don't know to what degree in your communities you're exactly at, but we could sure find out pretty darn fast if you want to know. So when it comes to survival services, who thinks, who thinks in the middle of an epidemic of childhood trauma that you might want to have behavioral health care? Do you think that's a luxury service? This is a survival service. So you need to know in your community to what degree can your families access this? Medical and dental care, is this a luxury or should in a country this wealthy somehow find a way to make sure everyone can access this? Now the good news is, in many communities in America, a lot of people have health insurance, some people are on Medicaid, Medicare, so your pie chart may say, may indicate that many people do have access, so that's great news. Maybe only 25% aren't quite doing it. So you just have to figure out, how does the private sector and the public sector come together and say, how do we make sure that 25% can access? Does that make sense? So you don't have to start and think, oh my gosh, in my community, we have to like turn into Sweden. No, you don't have to turn into Sweden um, in terms of having these services already in place. Because in many ways, you have them already. But you need to know to what degree. 
And you need to know not only do they, agree, do they exist, but of what quality. And your survey that we can easily make available to you and easily implement can be done very, very quickly if you want to know. Safe and stable housing, healthy food systems, transportation. Uh, you're, you, you folks are like me in that uh, we live in places where if you don't have a car, how are you going to do? I got to your Sholo airport and I looked for Uber. <laughs> and I'm still waiting for my Uber ride here. It's not quite there yet. I know, it, I know it's coming. I know it's coming. Um, but these are the survival services. And there is no excuse in America today that we cannot provide this. Because we've already done a lot of the work. Make sure that 100% of our kids and parents and grandparents who are caring for our kids have access to services. Because if we don't, we stay in a place called the status quo. And I spent the first 20 minutes telling you what the status quo is here, because I know what it is here, because it's the same everywhere. And remember, ACEs is not something for the other side of town. ACEs transcends socioeconomic class. So think of the wealthiest neighborhood in your community right now. Just envision those beautiful homes. They look really nice. And you could just think, life must be swell there. Don't think that for a second. Horrendous things happen in very wealthy households, at middle class households, everywhere. The wealthier do a much better job of keeping that a secret. We all work to keep it a secret. But the wealthy and the middle class can usually stay out of the newspapers. Lower income people, not so much. We want family-centered community schools. And you may be saying, well, what does that mean? Well, in an epidemic of childhood trauma, where the children gather five days a week, you're going to want a school-based wellness center. And that school-based wellness center is going to have behavioral health care. If not, good navigators to take you to medical care and dental care. Um, and these models are everywhere. Every state has full service community schools. They're fantastic. They have extra staffing. They have the funding for extra staffing to be able to have navigators to help parents find their way through the system. They have extra tutors for kids with high ACEs scores. They do amazing work. And if you want research on this, just type in community schools. You'll be overwhelmed by what what they will do for your kids and families. Early childhood learning programs, tons of research here. And I'm going fast. The point is, every, every sector I'm showing you, and there are 10, have decades of research behind the value. There's a field of study called, look, that looks at something called the social determinants of health. And basically, it's just what determines your health? It's the services that you have in your community either help you become resilient or possibly curse you to a life of absolute hopelessness and despair. Um, youth mentorship. Um, Big Brothers Big Sisters is considered the gold standard in this, though there are many wonderful mentorship programs. <coughs> and um, this is really interesting. Tons of research that will tell you, strongly indicate, that a child who can get a big brother or a big sister will do so much better in school, will delay alcohol use, drug use, um, parenting. All the good stuff goes up, all the bad stuff goes down with big brothers, big sisters. So the question would be, in my community, do we have that? If you're like New Mexico, some do, some don't. In some, they can't recruit men. The men will not volunteer. The men will not give up basically an hour and a half every other Saturday for a year. They won't do it. The women will. In Santa Fe, big sisters don't go in gangbusters. 100, 120 waiting for a big brother in Santa Fe. And Santa Fe is a very wealthy, parts of it are very wealthy, with a lot of retired, gray-haired people who look a lot like me with time on their hands. But they won't volunteer to help the boys of the community. And I'm always really struck by that. Like, what's that all about? What is it about us guys that we don't do that? I think there's something that, that that's a conversation to have, because that shouldn't be happening. I think it goes back to trauma. I think it goes back to just hard stuff. 
and we guys are like, it's the last thing I'm going to do is be with a kid who might have some issues, and I have to kind of be around that. But we also know there are ways to make that happen, and you're going to be working on that in just a moment. But this is low-hanging fruit. We don't need to build a building in your county to get this going, but we do need strategies. How do we recruit? How do we get the guys in? What are the other models? Parent supports, this comes in the, in the form of home visitation, the moment the child is born, there's someone like nurse family partnership that was mentioned earlier by uh, our doctor, tons of research behind that. Like you reduce bad stuff and you get good stuff. Many ways to do home visitation, also respite care and lots of parent education which now can go online. So there are lots of ways to innovate in this area too. Um, and job training in higher ed. Our parents need jobs and they need training. Most parents want to provide for their kids. And we have to do a much better job of providing that training in person, online, both. We have to make sure that our education system is in alignment with the job market. Let's not train people for jobs that won't exist because we know what jobs are going to exist tomorrow and in five years. And that's why we were really excited to be part of the college, because Dr. Bailey is all about alignment. But he's also about acknowledging the trauma that his students have that will keep them from ever really fully getting the training they need. But there's so much opportunity here, too. So I'm about to wind down, and we're about to get interactive. And uh, I know what I'm explaining to you may be I don't, I don't know, it may be too much or too complicated or how could we ever do it or what, what the heck is this guy really talking about? Or you might be thinking, I kind of like this, but how do I explain this to anyone not in this room? It's simple. 10, 10 sectors at 100%. 100% of our families get access to 10 sectors. How complicated is that, really? 10 at 100%. And as I said, for many of you, your communities may already be at 90% or 70%. So it doesn't mean tons of work, or it might. The point is, that's the work ahead. Now you could say, well, all well and good, but um, there are a lot of reasons why we can't do that. And, and that's the choice you adults in this room have to make. Because it's you adults in this room, quite honestly, that are gonna decide the fate of the Annas and the Andrews who are outside that door. You keep doing what you're doing, and you'll have the same rates of ACEs, the same rates of abuse, the same rates of all the bad stuff. Or you do something very, very different. And I'm, by the way, I'm not suggesting you people who are the champions, you've come out. You aren't doing this work. I know you are. It's that we have to work in a very strategic way, a very data-driven way, a very cross-sector way, and we must work in alignment. Because if you're already doing great work here in one sector, we don't replicate that. We know what you're doing, we support what you're doing, and maybe we boost other parts of that sector. Does that make sense? Alignment. In the, in the private sector, if you're a business person, you're all out of alignment. You don't, you don't repeat, you, you go where you need to go. So we need, it. we need our private sector thinking here as well. So what we have in New Mexico that I offer to you in Arizona is what we call the 100% Community Initiative. And it really is almost as simple as on a county level um, or a community level that you feel makes sense, whatever, whatever that community may be, um, that you make a commitment to bring together people who work in these 10 sectors and you form 10 action teams. And these aren't task forces who sit around and ponder the problem and maybe make recommendations. They're called action teams. They look at the problem, they assess the problem, they make a plan with logic, they implement in alignment, and they evaluate. It's called continuous quality improvement. It's a four-part cycle that just circles through. You're always improving every sector in alignment. And we will be starting that July 1st. So Dr. Courtney and I become the co-directors of the Anna Age 8 Institute. And we have three pilot sites, Donana County, 
Rio Arriba County, and um, um, Socorro County. We had thought, because we live in Santa Fe, Catherine and I live there, we thought, well, Santa Fe will be the first county that comes on board. So uh, I met with their newly elected mayor, a man I, I deeply respect, very well read, really, really knows his stuff, comes from the private sector. And we had a, we had a latte lunch, latte lunch, we're just sitting there having seven lattes. We, 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 maybe we had a few. Uh, and he uh, said, Dom, love the book, here's, here's my endorsement quote, you know, I, I agree with everything you've said, this should all happen. He goes, but Dom, I've just been elected mayor and I need to let you know something. The way government is set up today, we're not really set up to kind of oversee what you're talking about. As much as I think that should happen. We, we, you know, the city isn't over these sectors. And so we had a really good conversation. And, and I said to him, I, I go, you know what? I, I, I understand that today, city government, county government, school board government, state government, you're not set up to do what I'm saying today. But that's called the present. I'm talking about the future. Can we, can we change what government does, working in collaboration with the private sector to get where we want to go. So part of your job, if you choose to take on this initiative, is to talk to your elected officials, many of whom are in this very room, and say, could we, is there a way that our governments could support this kind of work, obviously with our nonprofits and, and all our other partners? So again, 10 action teams and it's really, you're developing change initiatives. You're gonna be working an action team and you're gonna see like, wow, in, in, the food, in the food sector, you know, we have a great food bank. As a matter of fact, it's fantastic. It's doing so great, you know. So two days a week, it's doing super. Well, what about the seven, what about the other day? Well, they can't be open those days. Well, could it be open those days? No, they don't have the funding. Well, could we meet and talk? Could we bring in Starbucks? I mean, this is the thinking we need because I can tell you, with you in this room and the people you know, you can fix every sector. It's not brain surgery, but it does require focus. And it requires all of you sharing with one another your great ideas. One other thing to think about, what we're going to be working on is... Um, where do our action teams meet? Like, really, physically, where, where do these people meet? Like, where's a good environment to be sitting in? Should you be in a second floor, two floors down basement with bad lighting and no water where I worked for many years in child welfare? That's not the environment you want to be in. Can we not create what the business sector does? Create incubator spaces, innovation spaces, right? Where we think about startups and think differently. We need to create a spot where you can all meet and come together, and you can bring young people in. Because I tell you, some high school people will tell you exactly how to fix some things. So this is a way for you, for us, to bring in all the generations. Our grandparents, the parents, the teens, bring them together, the private sector, the public sector. So what I'm talking about has not been done yet, by the way. What we've done for 20 years is there have been very noble people wanting to do things, and more than things, but we've been in silos. We work in one sector over here, a foundation funds one sector to do something for three years, goes away. We can't work like that anymore. This has to become institutionalized. So eventually, one day, your city will have a department of, well, they already have a fire department, they already have a police department and a parks department, can't they have a Department of Family Resilience that oversees this process to make sure? And it's not that the city has to do all this, they just assess and make sure it's happening. Can't the county have a similar department? Can't the school district also have one? This is where we can get in five years. If you people in this room decide that you want to change the future. Ultimately, it's as simple as this. Either we in this room, we adults, decide that all our kids get a chance to succeed, or only some of them do. And this is where you have to do some soul searching here. Because really, it comes down to this question. What percent of, of your children in this community deserve a chance to succeed? 
10%, 20%? If we get to 60%, is that enough for you? 60% of our kids get a chance, and we're kind of sorry about the 40, but as they say in some counties where I talk, you know, those parents, they don't really deserve our help. They're not deserving. I hear that all the time. I don't, I'm happy to talk with anyone about what parents deserve or don't deserve, but to me, that's not about the parents. What do the kids deserve? Let's separate those two. And trust me, I get there are some parents that I would I don't know if I'm going to invest in anything that helps them. They don't seem to really deserve it. But really, really, Anna's mother, in the book we call her Cassandra, we don't call her a monster. They called her a monster in the newspapers and on the news, and I mean for months, the monster. There was a group that formed. They were so upset with this death, they wanted to reinstate the death penalty to kill Cassandra. Think about it. Parents do monstrous things, very monstrous things, but they're not monsters because the moment we start pointing fingers is the moment we don't have to take responsibility. Because let me tell you, Cassandra was once eight years old. And you can imagine what her life was like. So all that said, we have an incredible opportunity here, in this room, at this moment, to change the course of this county and your neighboring counties. If that's where we want to go, if, if you want to join this, you can. And if you don't, you don't. I think that if New Mexico, and I mean New Mexico is rated by the Kids Count Report from the Annie E. Casey Foundation, we are rated the most unsafe state to be a child. 50th, we got 50th. Took a lot of work to get there. 47th, 48th, 49th, we've never, New Mexico's never been out. But New Mexico, just a few months ago decided with a new governor and new leaders, and new county leaders. They came together, they rallied around a little book, a little book that couldn't get published. And they read it, and they said enough is enough. New Mexico is gonna to commit to this, we're gonna make an institute, we're gonna get behind this and work in all counties. We will customize this process for every county, it won't look the same in every one, but we're gonna do it. And let me tell you, if New Mexico has done this, Arizona, can absolutely do this. So what I'd like to do is stop talking and do a little doing. And I know you guys probably want a little break. So I think what I'd like to do is I'm going to stop talking. I'd like to pitch a, uh, can, is a five minute break okay? Five-ish, is that all right? I want you to come back. And then we have a little work to do. It's going to be creative. So I want to thank you for listening. And I'll see you in five minutes. Thank you very much.